welcome everybody. It seems the majority of, of most of our, our watchers tonight are new to Genomic Light, so welcome. Um, I'll go into a little bit more about what Genomic Light is in a second. Um, today we are looking at drug targets to validation, and we have both Salman and Jack joining us from Open Targets, um, and we'll hear a little bit about what Open Targets is in a second. Um, but yeah, we'll go through a little bit of house rules first. So. Our events are all around helping everybody to explore the science of genomics and what it means for our lives. So um, there are there will be sections where we'll ask people to put questions into the, the Q&A box and um, in the chat box. Um, we just ask that everybody participate in a, in a spirit of curiosity and sharing. And there might be different views in the room, um, identities and experiences. So we just ask that everybody um, I sort of respect to all of those different perspectives um, and this platform will be moderated by myself this evening just um, so it's all inclusive for, for everyone um, so if you're new to genomics light and you haven't haven't been with us before um, maybe you're new to zoom webinar uh, there are a few little buttons that you might see at the bottom of your screen so you won't be able you should only be able to see myself uh, Jack and Salman on the screen and these presentation slides. You won't be able to chat with any other participants. You won't be able to use your microphone or your camera, um, but there are three sort of main buttons to interact with us tonight. So please use the chat button if you have any technical issues tonight. I will hopefully be able to try and sort these um, for you on my end. Um, uh, so yeah, just put any any like logistical technical questions in the chat button for me. Um, my name is Sam. I don't know if I introduced myself properly, um, but uh, I will be hosting tonight's talk. Uh, in the middle, you've got a closed caption button. So if anybody would like subtitles for the event tonight, please just press that button, and you should get a subtitled version of this talk. Um, if it gets in the way of anything that's on the screen you can actually drag and move that to a place that is convenient for you on the screen that you're using. And then when we get to the Q&A section, or if you have any questions that, are, that come up when you see any of the things that are being presented to you later on today, please do use the Q&A button. It's best if you throw in any questions that you have at the, as you go along, and that way we, we get them when, when, they, uh, when they occur, really. That means you don't have to remember them until the end. Um, so this is where we're based. So if you don't know where we're based, we are, all of us on the call today are based on the Welcome Genome Campus. Uh, it's in South Cambridgeshire in Hinkston. Um, hopefully some of you know where we are. If you don't, this is what it looks like. Um, and there are a bunch of different organizations that work on, on this uh, campus. So there's the Welcome Sanger Institute, there's uh, EMBL EBI, so that stands for the European Molecular Biological Laboratory. European Bioinformatics Institute. That would be the only time I say that in full, otherwise known as EBI. Uh, and today we're joined by uh, two um, campus staff that work for a, a, an organization and a project called Open Targets. Um, so we'll hear a little bit more about, about that today. Um, so yeah, and so welcome to everybody um, who, wherever you are based um, today and joining us. Um, so the way that the structure goes for a genomic slide is that we'll have a talk um, from Salman and Jack, and then we'll go through a QA, and a uh, and then we'll be wrapped up by, you know, half five. Um, the session will be recorded and it will be available on, on YouTube and our website. So if anyone has to duck out at any point um, or their connection drops, don't worry, you can catch up on anything uh, at a later point. We will post these on our website. Um, so, uh, I think it's first and foremost to introduce Salman to the to the room. So, um, Salman, I don't know if you want to just say hello and just introduce yourself and, and be able to just go through a little bit about your, your career path to this point so far for the audience. Of course. Thank you very much, Sam. It's oh, we can't actually hear you, Salman, at the moment. Um, oh, there you go. That, that's something that's coming through now. Check. Sound check. Yeah, there you go. We've got you. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Um, my name is Salman, and I am currently the near the generation experimental lead at Open Targets Validation Lab. And what what, what I do is I aim to generate um, good experimental evidence towards identifying 
new targets in uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Before I came to the Wellcome Sanger Institute, I did my uh, bachelor's at Swansea University in Wales. There, I also did a master's with a, a local company on uh, regeneration. And uh, after that, I finished my PhD at Swansea and following a short uh, postdoctoral spell at Swansea, I came um, here to the Sanger Institute and I'm glad I'm here. Amazing, thank you, Salman. And uh, Jack, uh, yeah, I wonder if you wanna just say hello to the room. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I'm Jack. Um, my background was in uh, mathematics, and then I followed that up with a master's in computational biology. Um, the timeline looks a bit funny, but I was essentially finishing my PhD when I started working at Open Targets roughly three years ago. Uh, my role as a statistical geneticist is to use publicly available genetics data to provide um, supporting evidence for drug discovery. Uh, and this talk, in this talk, I'll be going more into detail about what those words mean and uh, what exactly it is that I do. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Amazing. Uh, both of you, I think, I think if I remember those timelines, if I just go back, both of you joined um, us here on the Wealth of Genome campus I presume that those dates match up with the height of COVID, no? Um, how was how did you find uh, joining at that time? Um, well, yes, I, mean, I don't know if you want to yeah, go first. So, well, well, for me, um, there, I mean, COVID, because I'm a lab-based scientist, um, I couldn't really work from home. So um, I was working in the lab during the peak of COVID, um, with permission, of course. Um, and um, so, and during uh, some lockdowns, we simply had to work in the lab. Um, but that could that that is probably different to what Jack experienced. Uh, yeah. So for, for me, I, I I essentially was just stuck in my study, <laughs> um, coding away. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I could do any uh, all the work that I needed to do from home. Yeah. How did you find, uh, Jack, you were saying when you joined, you were doing your PhD, how did you find balancing starting a new sort of role and just sort of finishing up the, I presume, probably the most uh, crucial part of the PhD at the same time? How was that? Oh, yeah, it was uh, it was really rough. Um, I, if anyone else is thinking of doing a PhD and starting a job at the same time, um, I would recommend you, you get your thesis to essentially a final draft stage. For me, it was... Uh, it was nowhere near that. Um, I was maybe one chapter in when I started the job. So it was work by day, uh, thesis by night. Um, it was a really rough uh, first year, I have to say. But, uh, I'm glad that's all finished now. <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations that, 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 that you managed to do that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and there'll be plenty of time to um, unpack as well some of your uh, career career journeys a little bit further um, in the Q&A section, but I, I want to make sure I give enough time to, to both of your talks. So let me stop sharing and over to you, Salman, to share screen. Yeah, I'll do that. Can I confirm that it's the right view, Sam? Is it good? Perfect. Well, um, welcome everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Um, my name is Salman, as I said, and Jack and I will be talking on drug targets uh, to validation and focus in uh, today's uh, series. So let's start by asking a very uh, basic question. Um, what is a drug? And uh, Sam, if you could put, put up the poll now, um, is it a magical potion brewed by wizards for instant happiness? Is it a microscopic DJ spinning beats for your body's dance party? Is it a secret handshake between your cells unlocking the doors to wellness? Or is it a substance that when introduced into the body alters its physiological functioning for medical purposes? Okay, I think this was a good tester to just start everybody getting used to the poll, poll system as well. I think, I think we've got, got the majority of people um, uh, clicking the options that I think you would you would want them to click but 
Uh, yeah, we'll just keep it open just a, a little bit, a couple of minutes. Uh, but the majority of people have put D so far. That's that's the common consensus. You um, say D, Sam, the majority. How many people have voted? So we've got 97%. We've got 3%, which is uh, the first one, which is A. But um, that might just be because uh, you you create these questions so well, Sam. So uh, <laughs> it seems a shame that nobody would pick the other ones. So yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I will end the poll and I'll just quickly share the results so everybody can see. So uh, yeah, the, the most common consensus is the substance that when introduced into the body alters its physiological function for medical. Okay. To, the one, to the one person who selected A, a magical potion, I may agree with you on that because technically a potion could be a type of drug as well. So um, well played. So yes, um, uh, drugs are chemicals or biological compounds that are administered to the body to alter its physiological function. And when drugs interact, when they are introduced into the body, what they do is they modify the activity of their targets. Now, either by uh, stimulating them or blocking their activity, which is often uh, which often results in a therapeutic effect. For example, um, we've all experienced it when we take aspirin, for example, for pain relief. So over the past few decades, the pharmaceutical industry has become heavily focused on the discovery of therapeutic drugs for the treatment of many diseases, including cancer and neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. However, making a drug that is safe and effective is really hard. Sometimes it feels like finding a needle in a haystack because the chances of success are very low. The realities are it takes about 10 to 15 years usually to find and identify a drug candidate. Some, something that we think may work, we have to test its safety, its effectiveness in humans, and then getting it into the hands of patients. At the same time, it costs millions of pounds to do this. And unfortunately, there comes with it an emotional toll on patients as well um, um, who may experience um, different, different results and potentially some toxicities. So today, with our scientific capabilities, we can begin to test tens of thousands of compounds that could potentially be good drug candidates. And we can do this relatively at the same time. I have another, um, Safi, if you can put the um, next question up. Now, the next question is out of these 10,000 compounds, how many do you think eventually make it to the final stage, which is the regulatory approval before patients can take it? Okay, so the poll is up for everybody to vote. And again, likewise, like the, the first one, we'll just give everybody a couple, couple of minutes just to make sure everybody can has a chance to, to vote. Little bit more of a larger spread on this one um so yeah be interested to find out find out the answer so again if anyone didn't catch it at the start we have out of ten thousand compounds um how many do you think make it to the final approval rounds so we've got thousands hundreds tens or one i think it looks like most people have voted um if you haven't now's the last chance to get your answer in um, before I close the poll. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. So we have had, uh, so we had 5% say hundreds, we had 34% say tens, and 61% say one. So over to you, Simon, to let us know what the right answer is. If you answered one, you're absolutely correct. From the, the drug discovery stage to the preclinical development, it's a drop of 10,000 to mere hundreds, then to single digits in the clinical developmental phase, and then all the way to potentially, and that's potentially only having one compound that is approved. So clearly we can see that the chances of finding successful candidates are pretty low. And in order to better help patients, we therefore need good biological drug discovery and target selection programs. And therefore our mission is to make sure that the best drug candidates with the highest chances of success are taken into the preclinical development. And this is where we come in. 
at Open Targets, this is built. Um, Open Targets is built as a public-private partnership to transform the drug discovery uh, sys um, programs through systematic identification and prioritization of targets at vast scales. What we do is we generate data from our genetics and functional genomics platforms, and as well as using publicly available data to build evidence towards linking a target to a disease. Overall, this serves as a foundational concept guiding the drug discovery process. And now Jack and I will now uh, highlight some of the key concepts in both genetics and functional genomics. Jack? Yeah, so I, I will be talking about open target genetics, where we utilize publicly available genetics data to uh, increase um, the success rate of drug trials. Uh, next slide, please, Salman. Uh, and why we do that is because it's well documented in literature that uh, having genetic evidence increases the chances of success for your drug. Uh, twice as likely if it's supported by genetic evidence and retrospectively looking at things, uh, two thirds of new FDA approved drugs were actually supported by existing human genetics evidence. And so now I'm going to kind of go through this sentence and break down what each part of it means. So I'll start by introducing what is genetics. Um, next slide, please, Salman. Uh, so the central dogma of biology is that we have a DNA sequence, uh, a genome within every single copy of our cells. And this DNA genome, you can think of it as a dictionary or a recipe book for making you, you. And how this works is that uh, at every moment that you, you're living, um, your cell is considering the environment it finds itself in. It looks through this DNA dictionary recipe book and asks, what do I need to do right now? Um, and the DNA, and su suppose that you can see a bunch of dysfunctional cells in the region and they need to die. Well, your cell will look, flip through the recipe book for proteins related to cell death and transcribe that DNA into RNA, which becomes proteins that have uh, downstream functions in maintaining the cell. Um, another example would be if there's too much waste product being produced by the nearby cells, your cell would flip through the uh, DNA recipe book. Let's make some proteins that clears away these waste products. And uh, so that's what um, you can think of your DNA uh, and genetics as do doing. <clears throat> and this, this recipe book is about 3 billion letters long. So it's quite, it's quite big. And in terms of the proteins that it can make, um, there's about 20,000 of them that's been well studied with well-known functions. Um, so, uh, so, DNA, so genes are DNA regions that can become proteins downstream. Uh, I hope that is clear. Okay, so next slide, please, Salman. Um, so this recipe book of ours is mostly consistent between individuals. And on average, we're 99.9% identical, uh, genetically speaking. Um, if you look at the figure in the bottom, this means that actually, in terms of genetic diversity, we, we are actually more similar to each other than the peas that you would find in the same pod. So um, that's quite uh, an interesting uh, stat for you, uh, a bit wholesome too. Um, so knowing that 99.9% .9 of our recipe books are identical. Uh, the remaining 0.1% um, is what we call genetic variation. And there's many different types of that. But for this talk, I will just be focused on a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is essentially where one letter in your recipe book differs um, between you and me. So on the right here, um, an example of that would be the, a cat tag uh, has changed into a cat tack. So the G has changed to a C. 
Uh, so knowing now that there's 0.1% of these um, SNPs that exist in your genome, uh, how many um, exactly would you expect to see between two unrelated individuals? And uh, that's one of the poll questions with some options. So this will require you to <laughs> remember how many uh, how okay, many letters yeah. there were in the recipe book from the previous slide. Okay, super. So yeah, let's read that question out again. So roughly how many SMPs, so single, single nucleotide polymorphism, would you expect to see between two unrelated individuals? And the options that uh, Jack's given you is 3,000, 30,000, 300,000 and 3 million. Again, I'll give you all a couple of minutes uh, just to input your answer. There's still a few to to put in your answer. We've got we definitely got a, this is the biggest spread of our of our polls so far. So yeah, I'm sure our audience will be uh, keen to know what the what the right answer is. Okay, if you haven't um, submitted your answer just yet, this will be your last chance to do so. Um, if not, I will end the poll now. Okay, so I'm sharing the results. So you can see that 25% uh, voted for 3,000, 15% voted for 30,000, and 20% voted for 300,000, and finally 40% voted for 3 million. Okay, over to you, Jack, to tell us what the right answer is. Yes, yeah, so the correct answer would be uh, 3 million. Um, so that's 0.1%, um, so one, one in a thousand um, of 3 billion would be uh, 3 million. And so that, that's still quite a lot of variation between each other. That's why we look so different, right? Uh, but other than that, um, these differences in our recipe book have consequences, not just in how we look, but also in uh, how likely you are to um, develop certain diseases, for example. Uh, and so now the challenge is how do we link um, these genetic variations to some of the complex diseases that are out there in the world. And so next slide, please. And so we, um, we do that with something called a genome-wide association study. And so the simplest setup of this is, suppose that we have the DNA sequences of everybody and we develop uh, and we divided everybody into whether or not you have Alzheimer's or you are healthy. It can be any other disease. And then we, we just compare line by line um, everybody's uh, DNA sequences. Well, um, and sometimes a situation like this would show up. Okay, So, you, so you, you would see a variation that exists at a higher frequency in your Alzheimer population compared to your healthy population. Um, and so from this, you can find the genes or the proteins that's responsible for your disease. And that allows you to target um, them as potential drug targets because protein is uh, easily accessible to drugs. They're quite specific and you, know, you can have quite a big effect on your biology by targeting these. Um, here, the gene is quite obvious. So what's happened here is people with Alzheimer's I have changed the letter M to a P. So um, instead of saying ample, um, it's saying apple. So that's obviously had a detrimental effect somehow in your development of Alzheimer's. But um, just to ensure that we understand how genome-wide association studies are set up, uh, I have another poll question. So. Um, what kind of traits do you think you can actually run this type of study on? Uh, I don't actually have the option here, but Sam, would you like to read that poll out? Yeah, so which of the following traits can be used in a genome-wide association study? So we've got height, 
number of cars you drive, personality, whether you smoke or not, or all of the above. Um, so put in the answers that you think um, in this study. So again, just for uh, for sake of um, anyone uh, potentially watching the recording or um, hadn't quite caught that, it's which of the following traits can be used in a genome-wide association study? Height, number of cars you drive, personality, whether you smoke or not, or all of the above. Okay, so we've still, still got around about half of you to sort of put a, uh, sort of submit your, your answer. I'll give you just sort of 30 seconds or so to get in. Okay, anyone, anyone who wants to vote but hasn't had the chance to do so, do so now. Um, I'm just about to close the, the poll. Okay, so let's share the results. So we have 54% say height. Nobody said numbers of cars you drive. Nobody said personality. Uh, we have 14% say whether you smoke or not. And we have 31% say all of the above. So, Jack, what's the, what's the right answer? Yeah, so um, height is definitely one of the ones you can run a GWAS on. Um, but the question was, can, can you run a GWAS? And actually, uh, the answer is, given that you can divide the population um, based on all of those criteria, you could theoretically run a GWAS on all of the above, uh, although you might get some uh, very nonsensical results for some of the things, such as how many cars you drive or your personality. Uh, so I'm glad nobody picked those because um, those things may not necessarily have much to do with your genetics, uh, but, but it would be interesting to see someone run an analysis of that. Um, the problem with personality is that uh, it's quite difficult to have a consistent definition of your personality to divide you up into groups. But assuming you can do that, then there's nothing stopping you from running a GWAS to find out um, how your genetics influence your personality, essentially. Okay, so that's the poll finished. And um, let me just bring your attention back to what we've summarized here is that essentially, we can find genetic variation that, can, that links um, genetics to your likelihood of developing disease. And sometimes um, interpreting that information is quite straightforward. In this case, we know that apple and ample are related to the Alzheimer's disease. And so someone would take this result downstream to validate this as a target. Okay, next slide, please, Salman. Um, but what happens when the gene or protein responsible is not so clear? So um, there are actually no spaces in the DNA genome. So in this recipe book, instead of having a space, you have um, regions of gibberish, essentially, to act as spaces. And these, these parts of the genome are called non-coding regions because they don't code for genes or proteins. Uh, next slide, please, Salman. And, and actually, uh, 90 over 90% of um, GWAS-associated variation are found within these non-coding regions of the genome. So, so how do we interpret this? Um, you don't know which gene or protein to target using this because, well, essentially, if you're reading a recipe book, <laughs> there's, there's a variation in how long a space is. Um, how, do, how does that tell you which uh, targets to go for. But fortunately, we, we have had some developments so, um, to provide supporting evidence. So let's explore some of these data sets. Um, next slide, please, Salman. Uh, so let, let us go back to the uh, GWAS um, setup again. So on the left, we have the um, same thing as before, but now the variation is found in a non coding region, like a space. Um, and on the right, we have another GWAS, except instead of looking at uh, Alzheimer's, it's looking at um, the expression levels of a particular gene, in this case, Apple. Uh, and to interpret this box plot, you can uh, summarize it as follows. So when you have the letter G 
in this particular spot, uh, you have a lower level of expression for your Apple gene. And on the right, uh, uh, sorry, and on the bottom, if you have the letter A, where um, the other people have G, you have a higher level of the Apple gene. And then if you go back to the left again, you'll see that having G increases your chance of having Alzheimer's and having A decreases your chance of having Alzheimer's. So we might not know why that is, but co-localization is an analysis which comes in and asks, are these association signals essentially the same? And quite clearly here it is. And from that, you can draw the conclusion that the Apple gene is somehow relevant in you developing Alzheimer's. However, I must say that this does not give insight into causality. So you don't know if you have lower levels of Apple gene because you have Alzheimer's or if it's the other way around. So this can only be treated as a form of supporting evidence for taking the Apple gene to, um, on further in the drug development process. Okay, next slide, please, Simon. Uh, some other um, ev epigenetic evidence for decoding this non-coding association uh, is something called epigenetic modifications. So epi uh, in Greek means to, to be on top of. So it's on top of your genetics. These modifications don't change the underlying recipe book themselves, but, um, but they can affect uh, the, the expression of genes and proteins um, by means of chemical modifications. So you can think of these as annotations on your recipe book. Um, the entire premises of this is that your DNA genome is very, very long. Uh, because it's 3 billion letters long, uh, although each individual nucleotide is very, very small, uh, you need a microscope to see it. But if you link them all together from start to finish, you would actually have a line that's two meters long. Um, so to fit that two meter of uh, DNA into a single tiny cell, um, your DNA has to be wound up round and round and round uh, around a spool shaped protein called a histone. And these histones can then be chemically modified uh, to affect the expression levels of the gene to either increase it um, or decrease it by silencing it. So it will be similar to someone having a highlighter and highlighting these regions um, in a way that kind of makes it more apparent that, uh, that this word is important here. Or um, in terms of silencing a gene, it would be similar to underlying the text on the right. So uh, kind of saying that although this DNA sequence is here, uh, we don't actually need it in this cell, in this situation currently at this time. Um, next slide, please, Simon. And so sticking with this analogy of, uh, uh, sorry, st sticking with this consequence that DNA is wound up around the spool, uh, what can happen is seemingly uh, distal regions in linear space uh, can actually become closer together to each other in 3D space. So think of a piece of paper being crumpled up you might have text that goes from left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right. But once you've crumpled that piece of paper up, you could end up with um, actually a new sentence altogether somewhere along the edge of that piece of paper. Uh, and so that, that's another um, type of evidence that we can use. So does my non-coding uh, variant um, interact with a gene uh, in 3D space? because of where they are um, in terms of being wound up inside the cell. Um, yeah. And so next slide, please, Simon. And so we integrate all of these types of data together. Um, on the left is uh, essentially GWASs. We c connect diseases to your genetic variation. And then on the right is uh, the things that I just mentioned, the co-localization the kind of 3D folding of the genome where the non-coding variants are interacting uh, and various 
uh, highlighted annotations of your recipe book. We take all of these things into account to provide supporting evidence from essentially from disease to gene. And that allows uh, us to come up with novel uh, therapeutic targets um, for downstream drug development. Uh, last, last slide, please, uh, Sam. Oh, sorry, next. Yeah. And so we feed, um, and so that goes into a machine learning pipeline that we have implemented uh, at Open Targets to kind of systematically go through every single publicly available uh, GWAS result, which uh, currently sits at around um, 57,000 studies. And so for all, every single association found within those studies, we can tell you which gene or protein is likely to be underlying that association. And, um, and that lets you use that as a supporting evidence for any novel drug targets you might have. Okay, uh, last slide, please. And, and so to summarize what we do at Open Target Genetics, these are the main points. So using the genetic targets, that um, genetics data sets I just mentioned, we can narrow down any uh, drug hypothesis down to genetically relevant targets only to improve the efficiency. Uh, so let's suppose we go back to the Alzheimer and Apple example. I would come up, I would come to Salman with uh, all of this information and say, hey, look, this Apple gene, it, it's, uh, it's, it seems to be related to Alzheimer's. It's, you know, it's near this region that's associated with Alzheimer's risk. Um, this signal is exactly the same when it comes to expression of Apple gene and whether you have Alzheimer's. They're in close proximity in 3D space and, they, they, and they're highlighted together. Um, so they're, they're clearly active. Could you look into this with some further validations, please? Uh, in addition to that, um, the platform that we've developed can also give you into other biological mechanisms underlying the disease. So not, not only looking at um, Apple and Alzheimer's, but maybe Apple is um, related to other diseases too. And how, how is Apple um, exactly affecting your chances of developing disease? What are the other genes that Apple is interacting with? Um, and of course, if you, um, don't care too much about the genes. You can just look at the disease level. So, uh, so, so comorbidities, environmental risk factors, um, that would be like running co-localization between, uh, let's say height and stroke. So does being taller increase my risk of having a stroke or something like that? But there's a lot of interesting things you can do with genetic evidence, but um, I would say that the most uh, key takeaway is that it, it provides some form of supporting evidence for any drug discovery opportunities you might have. Um, and yeah, so keep the Apple and the Alzheimer's example in mind, and uh, Salman will take it away with the functional genomics validation part of this talk. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, thank you for discovering that the Apple gene is relevant to Alzheimer's disease. I am now going to use functional genomics and its approaches to uncover exactly what the Apple gene does and whether it's therapeutic, it's a therapeutic agent uh, or a target in Alzheimer's disease. Now, to see how functional genomics can help in the drug discovery, let's define what it is first. Functional genomics is delves into how genes contribute to the phenotype in an organism. And as Jack just mentioned, a gene is just a segment of DNA. And when we say phenotype, we basically mean an observable phenotype. Um, now, Jack demonstrated the central dogma of biology, which is the code in DNA is transcribed into RNA. And then that is then translated into protein. And these proteins of varying shapes and sizes give traits to cells from movement to metabolism to communication with other cells. And on a wider organism level, it gives us traits such as eye color or blood type. So studying genes is what we do. The next question is, you know, how do you do it, right? How do you study genes? And what our laboratory allows us to do, it has tools that we can then use to look at, um, uh, look at um, these genes on a very large scale, what we call high throughput uh, techniques. And what this then allows us to do is, 
Yeah. So what this allows us to then have, uh, is to look at or take the lessons from from the first two and then be able to validate our findings using not the same method all the time, but different orthogonal approaches. And we do this every day in the decisions that we, we take. For example, when you go and check the weather, you first look outside to see if clouds are there. Then maybe you may check the internet to see whether you know the patterns, uh, the pattern predictions are correct. Or we may even take our own instruments and measure wind speed and so on. So validation gives an extra level of confidence to us that we are making the right decision. And so let's go. Let's now get to the understanding of what the role of the apple gene is. And Jack introduced us to it, and he showed that there is a genetic evidence linking the apple gene to Alzheimer's disease. Now to do this, to um, to now functionally um, assess the link between um, apple gene to Alzheimer's, let's pick up some very important tools. Let's get some brain cells. Let's get a magnifying glass that can, that can show us where DNA is exactly so that we can then use our scissors to, to cut the apple gene. And then let's see what happens when we cut it. So before I... Uh, before I go into how we cut the apple gene, we get some brain cells, but we can't go into people's brains and get those cells, right? So how do we do it? How do we get enough cells to work with in the lab? What we have to do is we have to make the lab. We have to make the cells. And how we do it is that we change the programming of human skin cells, for example, and then turn it into stem cells. Now, this figure you see on the left top right hand side is a metaphorical landscape that illustrates the process of cellular differentiation during development. So as we develop, we gain different phenotypes and that leads to different cell types. The landscape resembles a series of valleys and hills, as you can see, and we gain different phenotypes and that leads to different cell types. The landscape, so the cells here are, are uh, depicted as balls rolling down this landscape, moving towards an alley. And at the top of this landscape, we can see this green ball here. There is a hill representing a pluripotent state where the cells have the potential to become any cell type. These are the stem cells that have been reprogrammed from the skin cell. You can see from here all the way to the cell, stem cell state. And then they're then pushed towards different uh, cell types. Now. Through this method, we've been able to generate uh, cells of the brain. We drained the cortical neurons. These are the cells from your forebrain. And then we've also generated the midbrain uh, neurons. These are cells in your midbrain region called the dopaminergic neurons. Now, the takeaway message is that here is human cells can be reprogrammed into pluripotent stem cell state. They can then be programmed again into vulnerable cell types that are linked with various diseases. And so the second tool that we talked about is taking a scissors and then cutting DNA. And how we do that is using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. You may have heard of it. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 has really revolutionized and allowed scientists to edit the genetic code of living organisms. That's the DNA. Now, scientists, how we do it is we design a synthetic piece of RNA, you can see here, and that matches the target sequence on the DNA. Then the Cas9 protein here so, um, is guided by this guide RNA to find the exact location in the DNA where the edits or the cut needs to happen. And so Cas9, we can say here, acts like a molecular scissors, cutting the DNA at a specific location. And once the DNA is cut, the cell's natural repair mechanisms come into play. And in doing so, it introduces a small change in that sequence. And because of that small change, what we call a mutation, the gene is no longer on. It's no longer active. The light bulb has been switched off. And what happens is that eventually, this also means that the protein is not produced or the observable phenotype is not observed anymore because it doesn't exist. And so CRISPR cuts human DNA. It disrupts the gene therefore the protein, and then the, this allows us to find experimental evidence between turning a gene on and off to the phenotypes um, that we see in healthy and diseased cells. So I'm now going to, um, I'm not going to give an idea of how the, you know, what is, how the marriage between stem cells and CRISPR technology works in the context of functional genomics. The aim here, remember, is to 
identify what effects do genes have on phenotypes. And these phenotypes, as we discussed, are linked to disease. So in, this, in the case of this apple gene, you can see that in these, you know, in our very lovely brain cells, they're expressed. You can see the red in them. And we know, so the red you see here, these, this is the observable phenotype. The color red is that phenotype. And therefore, we know that at the genetic level, there must also be an apple gene that is on at the moment because we obviously see the red. Now, unfortunately for us, the this apple gene does not do so. It does not. It, it's harmful to your brain. It impairs the brain, and it, it impairs the cell, uh, the brain's ability to um, to take out what is equivalent to uh, trash in our brains. So when this apple gene is on, um, it impairs a process called autophagy. And autophagy is a biologically equivalent to a bin person that removes garbage from the brain, right? It has all this garbage and it doesn't know where to take it. So obviously it's asking, where are the brain? Where are the bins? And this, what happens is after a long period of time, all this junk in the brain is building up and that clogs the brain. And that leads eventually to a diseased brain. So can we link to an, can we link this gene, this apple gene, to an observable phenotype in this case, the number of bins available to take out the trash? So let's run an experiment now. Let's go in the lab. Let's take our cells and let's let's see what happens if we don't cut out the red uh, gene using CRISPR. And we can see that you know the color red is still there after a long period of time, and that means that autophagy is impaired. That means the brain cannot take out the trash and that clogs the brain, leads to disease. Now let's take CRISPR and now let's cut that apple gene and see what happens. Once we cut the apple gene, you can see that it's off. You can see the color is disappeared. What we can say now is that the phenotype is no longer observed. We've made a cut in the DNA and that means that gene is now off. It's silenced. That means the protein is not expressed. And voila, what do you know? That means that by turning off the apple gene, we've managed to help the brain find all the bins it needs to remove all the junk from the brain. And that removes all the clogs, all the backdated um, proteins that have been broken down, all the organelles that are damaged. And through that process of removing bad things from the brain, it leads to a healthy brain. So when Jack nominated this gene, we didn't have any experimental evidence to link it to Alzheimer's disease, but through functional genomics, through experimentation, now we found a link to Alzheimer's disease, and this has been validated. Now, one of the key features of functional genomics is that we talk about it being, uh, uh, you can scale up your experiment. So we can go from studying a single apple gene to potentially hundreds of genes at the same time. And how do we do it is that, imagine you're putting cells in a cupcake shaped tray. You can see here, this is actually a plastics that we then put cells in the lab. And now imagine you're applying different types of scissors to every single one of these cupcake wells. This represents cutting a single different gene in every well. And then we use a big microscope here to then study the changes in autophagy signals, right? And what happens is that we can then put a number to um, how many bins there are in every single well linked to the silencing of each individual gene. And through that process, through that iteration systematic pro process, we can then say these batches of genes are linked to the number of bins available. That means it's linked to autophagy. That means that it could potentially be linked to Alzheimer's disease. And so as a summary, um, I will leave you with this. Um, everything we do is, is building towards um, uh, uh, getting uh, more evidence to help with the drug discovery uh, uh, pipelines. And to do this, um, we use genetics and functional genomics as tools to help us do that. We combine uh, lots of genetics data, as Jack mentioned, to help create ideas for targets. And then we use functional genomics to understand how targets work, and how we can understand targets on a large scale. And this strategy 
um, in the develop uh, leads to the development of safe and effective medicines. Thank you all for your time. I think we'll be happy to take any questions at the moment. Super, thank you both for, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just started speaking and then cough. Um, yeah, so thank you both Jack and Salman for that really, really great oversight into Open Targets. And it's also just worth saying that Open Targets is, is quite a big sort of initiative and project. So there are also other aspects that we haven't even been able to touch upon today. Um, I know that there's been a few questions that have kind of come in off the chat. So just one that I know that Jack sort of provided an answer for in sort of text form uh, was just a question around, is Apple the real name of the gene? And if yes, where did it come from? So Jack, I, I just wanted to, to maybe just say to the rest of the group, I don't want to put anybody off eating apples as well uh, whilst, we, whilst we talk. So um, yeah, Jack, do you want to just sort of say your, how, your answer out loud, if that makes sense? Was it an example to help simplify things or, or was there sort of something behind it? Uh, no, Apple is not the real name oh, of the gene. Oh, we can't actually hear you. Oh, there Hello? you go. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So no, Apple is not the uh, real name of the gene. There, there is a something that sounds a little bit like Apple is uh, a apof, uh, but no. Um, and then the other question is, um, how are genes given their names? Uh, which is essentially when when a researcher discovers a new gene, uh, they will try and publish the, their findings in a paper. And usually, when when they try to publish that, they will propose. Um, some kind of novel gene name um, for their gene. Amazing. And then prior to publication, other researchers will uh, do the peer review process to ensure that that name is appropriate and uh, suitable for the gene. Super. And then there's just another one that's come in, which is what's the difference between SMPs and mutations? Yeah, I was, uh, I was typing up an answer um, to that as well. But um, Essentially, mutations um, can be uh, uh, SNPs, um, so mutations, but that, that occurs kind of at a much lower rate than SNPs. And mutations also do not necessarily need to be SNPs. There are other types of genetic variation um, that can exist. So, uh, for example, uh, mm, a regions of the genome might be repeated over and over and over and then how often that region is repeated um, is one type of variation uh, that can have consequences yeah okay super uh salman i think there's one probably yeah. for you here which is just is crispr cas9 very specific in its cutting and um uh can uh can there, there be, be mistakes, mistakes. Yeah. yeah so so crispr cas9 is generally highly specific but it's not perfect and it does have off target effects and it can occur the system um, relies on a guide rna to direct the cas9 protein to a specific dna sequence for cutting the guide dna is designed to be complementary to the target sequence and so the cas9 produces then introduces a double stranded break in that precise location However, there are factors that can contribute to off-target effects. If you have an imperfect design of guide RNA, for example, it can, it can tell the cast on to go somewhere else. Um, and if you have delivery methods that are not optimal uh, to the cells, it can have off-target effects. And it also very much cell type dependent. Um, you may find that it may be easier to edit brain cells or cut DNA in brain cells um, to, for example, heart cells. And so we do a several things we, to, to minimize that off-target effect. One of them is to optimize our guide design. Um, one of them is to increase Cas9 specificity towards that cell type and um, other factors. Amazing. Um, so there's, um, I just also want, someone pointed out in the chat to me directly that um, when I've been saying that I can't hear, it's actually me. So I do apologize. <laughs> there's clearly an error on my side. Um, so is uh, we've got a question, and I don't know if, if either Jack or, or yourself, someone are able to answer this, but is Open Targets a global endeavor? What are the contributions of scientists to this project outside of the UK? Um, what I might do just to complement this question is just also pop the website in the chat so that everybody can um, just sort of see the see the website. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Salman or Jack, you're able to answer. Um, uh, so 
global targets has um it's as i said it's built of private and public partnership and the private partnership it comes from pharmaceutical companies um, and they have ventured in, uh, they have interests all over the globe so in that sense yes we are a global company um on our uh, in our team we have companies like jsk pfizer sanofi um, genentech uh, so in that sense, yes, um, I would say Open Targets is very much uh, a global entity. We've got um, we've got some five more questions, and I appreciate the time. Um, uh, it's it's almost coming to the end, so I'll try to do my best. I know Jack, you're you're typing some in the in to give some answers to people, so that's really appreciated. So um, there's one which is what is done when a target can be directly related to an indispensable gene in the organism. Does anyone want to uh, answer that one? Uh, um, where is that question, Sam? Just uh, at the top there. Um, it just says, what is done when a target? Don't worry, if not, we can move on to another one and and get some I more can, answers. I can answer that question, but I, I, I saw another question, which was, how can CRISPR-Cas9 work with stem cells and later lead to drug discovery? So um, CRISPR-Cas9 can be integrated into the drug discovery program when working with stem cells. Stem cells generally are very uh, inducible to and very versatile to work with, and they can be edited very efficiently. So researchers can design guides to direct Cas9 to specific uh, regions in the, in the stem cell, and then, and then through um, that approach, um, they can um, link disease to, or link uh, gene loss or activation to a phenotype. Um, okay. Next question Amazing. was, um what was the next question sorry sam so i'm just I'm just conscious of time so i know that some people might have to drop off so i'm just going to take one more and then if not we can always get some of the answers to any of the unanswered ones to you um we can put them on with on the recording and stuff like that so just one that i wanted to just quickly how is pharmacogenomics involved in all of this so uh, i don't know if salmon or jack whether or not you're able to answer that one so, um, Jack, if you have an idea, then I'll be, I'll be happy to give my thoughts after. Oh, no, you, you go ahead. I'm uh, typing another one. Um, so, pharma, um, so this field examines, obviously, the relationship between an individual's genetic makeup and the response to drugs, right? So it does play a crucial role in personalized medicine, where you can tailor drug treatment to an, individual, uh, uh, to an individual's genetic profile. Amazing. Okay, well, I'm just conscious of the time, and I do appreciate that we haven't been able to get through all of the questions. Um, but thank you for answering so many. We'll capture the, the the ones that we haven't answered, and we'll make sure that we get um, uh, get answers as well. Um, I'm sure Salman and, and Jack will be happy to, to provide. Yeah, we'll um, yeah amazing. Um, so yeah, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you both to Jack and Salman for taking the time out um, to speak with us. Um, I hope to uh, what it seemed like the majority of the the, the, the people in, on the call today, um, they were actually uh, new to Genomics Lite. So I hope you enjoyed your first um, first one. Um, if you did enjoy this, we've got we're pausing for. It seems weird to say that we're pausing for Christmas, but when it's still only November, but we won't have a, another Genomics Lite until January the twenty fifth. Um, so if uh, you um, want to sign up to our next one. It is called What is a Gene? So we'll be looking at genes a little bit like what we've done today. Um, but in actual fact, we're looking at all of the things that we still don't know about genes. So we've kind of gone through the definition today, but what is there still unknown about genes and what are we actually still finding out about them? So make sure if you uh, liked today's talk um, that you sign up to the next one. Apart from that, I just want to again say thank you, uh, Salman and Jack, for joining us today. And also thank you for all attending um, this afternoon. Um, it's been really appreciated having you all here. And uh, yeah, um, thank you for and hopefully see some of you uh, at the next genomic slides. Um, really looking forward to them. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you as well, Sam, for uh, hosting. And thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you for coming. Bye-bye.